still all true I'd like to know your point of view Hi everybody, welcome to Evening TV, I'm Evening Ransom. The topic for today sort of chose me and it was an undeniable thing I had to do and that is because uh, my mother passed away. When talking about when your narcissistic or estranged parent dies, there's a lot to consider. And one of the first things I want to say is that what's really, really important is that you think about this before you get the call that, they're, that, they, that they died. I had been thinking about this for 20 years. And I had always, you know, prayed and been checking in with myself and asking, you know, asking Spirit, you know, let me know if there's something I've missed. If there's something I should do here, let me know. And I don't want to find out after it's too late that I should have done something else. The feeling that I had really was that they had died already. That, that who I thought they were, what I thought our relationship was, um, who I thought I was to them, all of that died and you know many many years ago maybe decide if you're going to go to a service you got to think about that too it depends you know what what your relationship was with this person what your relationship is with the rest of the family in my case if i went to a service i would be getting condolences and stuff from people that would feel really awkward to me because i have been estranged from my mother for so long and i would have to hear stories that wouldn't resonate with me no one knows the story no one and if anyone does know any kind of a story, it's going to make paint me as the, the bad guy. It's not going to know. That, it's not going to be anything close to the truth. So it would just be so awkward, and just be so. It would just be an opportunity for me to be mistreated and for me to be abused. And there's just no reason for it. I don't need to go to a memorial service. She's not at a memorial service. She's not. That's not where she is. So I mean, she might go to the memorial service, but. You know, I don't have to wait for that or be at that specific place to, to talk to her or to, you know, say a final goodbye or whatever it is people think they need to do. And, uh, you know, and I certainly wouldn't want to see her body or anything like that anyway. Lee, I had a, I had a sense of relief when she died because, you know, you, you have it, you feel energy. And if people are talking about you and telling lies about you and saying bad things about you and thinking bad things about you, even if they're a long ways away, you feel it, you know? And if it's your own family, you feel it. And so um, I've been picking up on, you know, bad energy coming my way for many, many years. And immediately I felt relief. I felt like my mother now doesn't have to do that anymore. At one point in 2005, after a lot of really dramatic, really awful stuff happened and I was at a real low at this time. I went to their house, on the house where I grew up, on Christmas morning. I went there for one hour with my kids. I saw that what, we, what, what they wanted me to do was act like nothing had happened. Just like act like nothing had happened and that go back to the, to, go back to the belief that they were perfectly fine parents and that everything was normal and good. And I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. I, there was so much had happened and I'd been so dramatically affected. Um, it just been, you know, it was just really, the choices they made had really dramatically impacted my life. It was just so strange. And I left there, the thing I left with was I said, if you guys ever want to get together and talk this through with a therapist, and you can pick the therapist, but, you know, just talk about what happened with the therapist. I am open to doing that anytime. And my mother said, we don't trust therapists. And so that's where it was left. And of course, their story all this time has been, we don't know what happened. Our daughter just turned her back on the whole family, all of her friends and family. And we just don't know why. When you have a narcissistic family, you can expect all kinds of strange things to happen. For instance, what happened to me yesterday was that my former sister-in-law, my brother's ex-wife, who um, was very, very abusive to me, called me. It took me a while to process my feelings about it. Um, I felt really not at ease about it. I, I regretted answering the phone. Didn't do anything that was overtly abusive at all. Um, but, the com the, but, the, but the conversation didn't have any, any purpose. So the only purpose of it was to 
get drama. The nurses can play off of my emotions, get some new gossip, be able to tell the family she talked to me. There was complete invalidation of my reality. Complete invalidation. The phone call was as though this loss of my mother was the first loss. As though, you know, there had been so much loss. I lost her already. I lost all of my family before. All of my family, my marriage, my friends, my money, my home, my business. I lost all of that before. Then I lost my son. You know, also I lost my health. I mean, I, lo I lost all of this. And this was the first phone call she made where she's like, I'm sorry about your loss. You know, I'm, I'm really sorry about the loss of your mother. I go, well, honestly, I feel like I lost her 20 years ago. And it was like, that wasn't, you know, it was like, that wasn't a reality either. And it would have sounded, like I said, perfectly normal and healthy to anyone listening in. You would not have thought there was anything unusual about this family. Uh, but completely invalidating of my entire experience of what life has been like for me, what my reality is, what they, how they treated me. They have it fixed in, your, in their heads how this story goes. And so they will invalidate your experience if that doesn't fit their narrative. And so, you know, they decide who you are. And if you're supposed to be the abusive, uh, irresponsible, angry, toxic kid that left, you, know, you can't very well have been, you can't have been a victim of theirs, that's for sure. But she was talking about how everyone, everyone will, you know, everyone's gonna look out for your dad, he'll be fine. You know, my son's over there right now, my daughter will go over there tomorrow, and we're all looking after him. And the reality for me, for a few years ago when my son died, was I was completely alone. When narcissists will abuse you, it sounds fine to an outside party, but you know what's really going on. And so, you know, she's saying all these things to me, but the side that she's not saying is, we know how to act. We act like a normal family. We just didn't do it for you. But we're gonna blame you for it. You know, we're gonna act like we didn't do it because you rejected us. I hung up the phone and I got to thinking about why it was that she called. I realized there was no point in her calling me. Um, and and it, she wasn't the appropriate person to call me anyways. We didn't have a good relationship. She was, she abused me. And I, why would I trust her? And you know, just, Prepare yourself for anything to happen. Do not, whatever you do, do not be holding out for any kind of deathbed apology, uh, realization. The, uh, the moments for my family to have a big realization, there were many. I mean, when I'm dying, it would have been one. Um, when my son died, it would have been another. Apparently, my mother had found out about this aneurysm issue three years ago and she knew it was like a ticking time bomb that she's had she didn't really she didn't think i'm gonna die i should probably contact my daughter she didn't do that then my brother and my father haven't contacted me still so it's an ongoing thing and it just it just doesn't get better and so you need to be prepared for that they are so invested in their false narrative and so invested in being right that they just can't afford to change their mind. They just can't afford to let new information in. Narcissistic parents really uh, make the most out of our societal norm, which the societal norm, thank heavens, is that parents do love their kids and that they're unconditionally loving of their kids. And most, you know, we all love our kids and that's the norm, right? And most people know, I love my kids, so of course everyone loves their kids. And they make, they really capitalize on this belief. And so, you know, people, People don't tend to believe that, pe that people would do this to their own family, they would do this to their own daughter, their own sister. You're under no obligation. If, you are, if you've been abused by this, th this person and you are no contact with them, and what, you're under no obligation just because you're their daughter or you're their whatever. You're under no obligation to go to anything, certainly not to plan or pay for anything. Um, you know, you're just, you're just not. And so you tell yourself what you, what feels right to you to do. And it's important that you not do anything to, because you want to, someone else to approve of you, or you want to look like a good person, or because you're hoping that it will send a message to them that they will appreciate you. 
because that's just never going to happen. I mean, it's just, you know, the chances of that happen, that's just a way of setting yourself up for more disappointment. And, you know, the only reason to do anything is because it feels good to you to do it. These people are not mentally well. They, they, have, come, they have made decisions from a place of, you know, lack of awareness. They made it. They made decisions from, from a very frightened and 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 sick place, and we can't we can't expect them to do any better. We have to accept that that's where they are, and expect them to make decisions like that. And so, just because you would do things so differently, and you feel so differently, you can't expect them to. Radical acceptance is the way is the way to go here and they are so different from you. They do not have empathy. They do not have empathy. And they do not have remorse. They do not have regrets. They, do, they just don't, and they don't have love. They don't have love in the sense that you do. Nothing my sons could do that would make me turn my back on them. Nothing, they're my son, that's what matters most of all. I always knew, if it hadn't been, it hadn't been this, there, there would have been, numerous things that had happened before or since this one thing happened where they would have disinherited me or disowned me um that, that was always a possibility you may feel as i do when if, if, if your narcissistic parent dies that you already grieve that loss and largely what we are doing is we are grieving the loss of the parents that we never had that is really what we're doing but the other flip side is sometimes people feel that they have a grief because there's a finality about it. Now, now there's no hope. Now there's, you know, the possibility that they were ever going to resolve anything is now gone. I heard the saddest thing when uh, this person was talking about that their abusive father had died and he said, now I'm never going to get his approval. And it was really sad. It's like a 60 year old man. And it's like, you were never going to get his approval anyways. If he was able to give you his approval, you would always have it, you know? You were a great son, someone we were blessed to have. I was a great daughter, you're a great son or daughter. There is nothing wrong with us, nothing wrong with us, and we should have been approved of all along. So the fact that we were trying to earn, earn this love all the time explains that it was an abusive relationship all along. That hope sometimes keeps us hooked in to a pain. I know it did for me because Having that, having that as a hope or a possibility also meant they were continuing not to do it. And so every time there was a, a thing where it was like, you knew as a mother or as a sister what you would do and they didn't do it, it was, you know, it was, a new, it was a new injury. It felt like even though we had not been in touch for many, many years, there were new injuries all the time because of that. They didn't do things that a, a healthy parent would do. And, and you know, you're bur you were born deserving to be loved by your parents, deserving to be loved by the people that were there to greet you when you were born. That was your birthright. And so it is not the way things are, were intended to go naturally in the course of nature for you to be uh, abused by your family and estranged from your family and you know, basically find the people that were closest to you were your biggest enemies, the ones trying to harm you the very most. So, you know, that is not a normal thing and it's okay for you to grieve about that. And so a lot of times the grieving we're doing is not necessarily over the death as it is just the whole realization of all of it. So being born in narcissistic parents, it will set the course of your life. When your parent dies, You've already been through a lot. You've already done a lot of grieving and you've had a lot of loss. But this is what was so invalidating about that phone call from my sister-in-law. Completely personal decision about how you handle anything and you're not wrong for whatever you do. None of this was your fault. Those moments of awakening are not likely to happen. And if you're holding on, and you know, if you're holding on waiting for that, or you're even going to come to the memorial service because you're hoping your brother or your dad or your you know your surviving relatives are going to say something nice to you that's probably not a good a good idea probably not a good plan to do it uh, for that reason you really have to if you're going to do anything like that really have to do it with no expectation not because of what anyone else is going to do or how you look to anyone else just purely how you're going to feel about yourself 
going forward. That's the only reason really to do anything because they don't have the same feeling of connection and and love and family and all that 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 normal healthy people do and so they don't value things the same way and they don't value you clearly in the same way it's very hard for us to even if we were raised this way all of our lives it's still very hard for us to believe how they see us it's still very hard for us to believe how detached they can be from their own children and their own sister and you know it it really is it really is amazing how cruel they can be and and how much resentment towards one person they can have and and only in a only in a very sick system would this kind of ganging up and scapegoating even happen and um, you know and in narcissistic families just love it complicated grief is grief that doesn't go through the stages and heal itself in the in the uh, regular amount of time it goes on for an extended period of time and and you just it's just not getting better and you need some help uh, complicated grief is not regular grief it's grief that's been complicated by say for instance uh, it's not just your mother dies but you were already estranged or you know you had an abusive relationship that can really create complicated grief or if you've been abused emotionally abused narcissistically abused you already know what it's like to go through disenfranchised grief, which is grief that's completely not recognized by, by the, the people. When you are estranged from your narcissistic family, you're not getting flowers or sympathy cards. Most likely you're being talked about as a bad person and totally misunderstood and, uh, and you're doing a lot of grieving alone. We come to the point of our parents dying in much different shape mentally and everything than than other people they honestly used to say if my parents had died in the 2001 uh, airplanes the 9-11 airplanes my life would have been infinitely better you know they caused me a lot of harm and I never recovered from it fully and my sons didn't either you know my life would have been would have been so much easier and so much better so much so much less of a struggle if my parents had died 20 years ago and you know that's the truth so you know those are different situations than most people are dealing with and that's not going to be something that most people are going to understand it and, and that's probably extreme for you too i mean i'm not expecting that everyone has narcissistic parents is going to say that same thing but and so you know not having any contact with my family really is the best thing because there's really nothing that I can think of that they've done for me or my kids that has been helpful or honest or loving in in the least since before all since before 2001 and at that point my children were uh, you know very young he says his only memory of me with my mother his only memory his whole life of me with my mother was at his was at a birthday party I planned for him and she was yelling at me so that's his only memory of, of me being with my mother so you know this is this is not a legacy that any normal mother or grandmother would have let happen your sense of it when your parent dies is not going to be anything like what what people's relationship is like that this is a really the first big loss. A relationship where they were kind and good and loving and they contributed to your life and they were an important piece of it or just, just a comforting piece of it or just you know, there was nothing bad about it. They weren't costing you anything. Like how I felt about my grandmother or something like that. That's a whole different thing than when you've been abused and you've had to uh, make decisions not to let this person into your life because they're harming you and you know, and that's gone for you. You've already you know, you've already been through a lot of loss at that point. It's important that you don't invalidate yourself, and, you know, that you validate your experience and you understand what your experience is. Your feelings are your feelings. You have, every, you have absolute right to your feelings and there's no way that anyone can tell you how, how you should feel. But, you know, the main thing is think about, think about what, how you're gonna do when, when they die when you go no contact. You know, don't go no contact if you're going to feel like if you if there's anything left to say, you know, don't go no contact if there's anything left to say because 
you never know what's going to happen. You never know. You could have 30 years, or you could have three days, you know, so don't do that. That's a way of setting yourself up for having regrets or grief or something. If you have something to say, you need to say it. It's really important that we be completely honest and courageous on our side. That's keeping our side of the street clean. We need to do that. We need to be we need to be authentic and we need to be courageous and that's our job. We can't change them, but we owe that to ourselves. You know, I can feel okay about it because I know that I, I made that one last effort in 2005 and then I said, we can meet with a therapist and I meant it. We can meet with a therapist. Whenever you want, you can choose a therapist. And I put that out there and I meant it and ever since I had an open door and they chose not to walk through it. Uh, but that's all I can do. You know, that's all I could do. And so I really do feel completely okay about it when she died. I feel, I feel sad for her that, um, you know, that she had this wonderful daughter and, and grandsons and missed out and caused a lot of conflict and grief and so that was absolutely unnecessary. She didn't value the same things I do. I would have valued, I valued family. I would have loved to have had a daughter like me, but she didn't value that as much. She wanted to look like a living family. She wanted to look like a good mom. And, you know, she wanted to look like she had a close relationship with, with her daughter, but she didn't really want one. She didn't really want intimacy. She didn't really want connection. She really didn't want to have to worry about anyone else's needs. You know, that's, that's the truth. And so it took me a long time to understand that. A cystic parent is, does have the opportunity to see things clearly when they die, I believe. I believe that they, because of my near death experience, I know I had a life review, and I believe they get a life review, and that they're going to get a chance to feel your pain. They're going to get a chance to see what it was like from your perspective, and they're going to get a chance to to see other options and choose, was there a better way you could have done this? A more loving way to do this. And so they are going to feel that. And so I believe that when a, an abuser dies, the energy rises. There is an energy lift. Your vibration can get up a little higher when that happens because there isn't someone lying about you, slandering you, dragging you down. and. Um, and I, you know, I really believe that that is true. And I really felt it. I felt it almost immediately uh, when I heard the news about my mother. But uh, there are things that I wonder about. I wonder if you like, my mother can get a message back to my father. You know, like, oh, you know, change your ways before it's too late. You know, I, I've seen the light. <laughs> you know, it'd be kind of cool if she could get a message back to my dad or my brother about what she'd seen. I haven't cried. I cried a lot years ago. Uh, but I didn't cry. The only, my, my, my one thought was about uh, that I was envious because she got to be with my son and my grandma who were like, you know, my favorite people. I suspect that my mother and I have a better understanding today than we've had ever. So that kind of feels pretty good. If you want to talk more about uh, narcissism and death or estrangement or what it's like to live being estranged, uh, go ahead and put that in the comment section and we can talk more about it. Okay. Thanks so much. I'll talk with you later. Bye-bye.